we're seeing things that we've waited generations to see. And tonight what we want to do is, is have a look at the signs, particularly in the Middle East and in Israel, that tell us that, that Christ is very near. He's, in fact, knocking on the door, just as anyone does, to let you know they're about to come in. They're, they're almost here. Christ knocks to let us know he's on his way. This is our last session, of course, for today. And what we want to look at is Israel and, and its neighbors. And we want to have a look at a number of prophecies. Some of them will be familiar. Some of them, hopefully, less so to most of us. But what I hope we're going to see out of this evening is that God is absolutely and completely in control. Even while the world around us seems to be spinning faster and faster, blurring almost in the way it changes and twists and morphs, and no foundation out there seems stable anymore, I hope that we're going to see underneath all of the chaos that there is an inexorable, irresistible, implacable order as the angels, piece by piece, implement God's designs in the kingdom of men. We want to see that every day the shape of the world around us is conforming more and more perfectly to the prophetic plan. And, and we've seen that already with our, our brethren. We've seen through what's been happening in Russia, what's been happening with the church, what's happening in Europe, that the world around us more and more conforms to exactly what the prophets <coughs> laid down long ago, thousands of years ago. And now we want to look at Israel and their neighbours and see how every day they more closely resemble what we should expect to see. So let's start with Israel. We know that the return of the Jew to the land is that great witness, isn't it? We've looked at this passage in so many lectures over so many nights. You are my witnesses, says God. They were going to come back to the land. And Brother Thomas, writing in the 1840s, could look at scripture and understand what it said. And he wrote in Eureka, uh, sorry, in Elpis, Israel, this passage, I'm sure all of us have seen this, that there's going to be a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation. Magnificent, impenetrable language. But what he's basically trying to say to us in this passage is the Jews were always going to come back. They were going to come back to the land before the return of Jesus Christ. And the section there in blue that I've highlighted says that they will immigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders, and they'll get rich in the land through commerce, through cattle, and through those sorts of things. And I, I remember reading this passage many times uh, and, and thinking, how does he know that there'll be agriculturalists and traders? It wasn't obvious to me how Brother Thomas had come up with this idea that there would be agriculturalists and traders. Well, we've looked at it tonight already once. Ezekiel 38, verse 11 and 12. The ration is going to go up against the land of unwalled villages. He says to himself, I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely. This is the ESV, by the way. All of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. He's going to seize his spoil and take off plunder. He's going to turn his hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people are gathered from the nations who have gotten... Rich who have acquired livestock and goods. There it is. There's agriculturalists and traders. They've got livestock, animals, agriculture going well, and they've got goods, trade, and they're very successful in those areas. And that's what the Bible said. That's what Brother Thomas interpreted almost 200 years ago. And that's what we've believed. And, and what do you know? That's exactly what's happening. This company that you can see, uh, this is the front page of a company brochure on the screen, Netafim. Um, it's probably not a household name for most of us. Anyone use their products? Oh, so one person uses their products. Excellent. There you go. They're sold in Australia. And in fact, as you can see there, they're sold all over the world. This company has actually just been sold to the Mexicans. And what do they do? Well, they are the world leader in drip technology, um, which is not technology of idiots. It's the technology by which we um, use very limited amounts of water to feed plants and by so doing can use less water, can get better agricultural output in, in very desert type areas. And they're the world leader in this. They're a multi-billion dollar company just sold to the Mexicans. And the Mexicans have said, we're not moving the company. 
No, no, no. It's going to stay in Israel for at least the next 20 years because you guys have got it nailed. You know what you're doing. And they're the world leader in this agricultural area. And if you look at what they're doing in terms of agriculture, again and again and again, they are leading the world. Diesel. Over in Western Australia, over 50% of our water is diesel. We go to the Israelis for good technology. They recycle their water. 90% of water in Israel is recycled four times more than anyone else on the planet. Dairy farming, their productivity is up. And you look at that chart and you think, oh good, they're doing well with productivity. They're probably just catching up with the rest of the world. Not so. ANZ, uh, sorry, ABC, our own news source, says that we're going to Israel to find out how to do it because they're twice as productive as we are here in terms of running dairy farms. And trade. Now this one caught me by surprise. They're the world leader in drones. It's a technology that, well, how long have we been talking about drones? Four, five years, and the world leader in drones technology. They're the fifth largest exporter of diamonds, but they have the biggest diamond trading floor on the planet. This one, this is a little bit old now. Back in 2012, they were the sixth largest exporter of arms. Tiny little country, pinpoint on the map. They've slipped to 10th. This year, they'll probably be up to 8th after a massive deal that they've just sealed with the Indian government to sell them uh, military equipment. Wall uh, Wall Street Journal this year. 25 companies to watch. These are the next Facebooks and Apples and you name it. Six of which are Israeli-based. Does that sound representative to you? Six out of 25 up-and-coming emerging companies are Israeli in the tech space. Again and again, when we look at what they're doing, they are leading the world in terms of trade. Such a small footprint on the global map and such a story of success in cattle and in goods. And so if we look at what's happened, we compare them with the OECD, the success of those industrialised nations, they're, they're leading year after year after year. As predicted by the prophets. They're prospering. They're growing rich. And those, I said this last night, but those old enough to have witnessed the events in 1948 will have been amazed to see God's witnesses, the Jews back in the land. And those who saw the events of 1956 or the Six Day War in 67 would have been amazed and electrified as God worked in the nation of Israel and bullets went round corners. 1973, Yom Kippur, but most of the people in this hall are not old enough to have seen or remember these things. For us, those events are ancient history. But the things that we want to look at next, these are new. And uh, this, this is really exciting. Have a look at this. This is one of Israel's neighbours. Syria. Footage, thank you to the Russians. Uh, one of their uh, very generous and humane things they're doing, taking drone footage of the damage they've created um, in the background. But this is a quote from Isaiah. Um, and the interpretation I'm using of this particular passage, it's not in the King James Version, but it is in Septuagint, RSV, Roth, and a number of other versions agree with this interpretation, which says Damascus will be taken away from among cities, it shall become a ruin, abandoned forever. The cities of, of Syria, says this passage, will be deserted. Forsaken are the desolate cities of Syria. Isaiah 17. Now it's not finished yet. That job is not yet complete. But look at it. That's Aleppo in the background. One of their major cities. An absolute ruin as far as the eye could see. And God said the cities of Syria, some of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on the planet, would be a ruin. And the Russians have made a very, very good start on that. And have documented how well they've done just so they can show us that they are fulfilling the work of the angels. Four million, over four million, almost five million refugees have fled fled Syria at last count. These these numbers are about two weeks old now. That's, That's over a fifth of the total population of Syria originally. 2.9 2.9 million in refugee camps, even still in Turkey. 1.1 million in Lebanon. Now just get this. Firstly, it does snow in Lebanon. Not a nice place to live in a tent. 
But Lebanon's got 4 million people to start with. Imagine that. Every fourth person you meet is a refugee from Syria. Jordan, faring a little better. This is one of the refugee camps in Jordan. 600,000 people in that refugee camp who fled south across the border into Jordan. Terrible, terrible thing. And God said, he said that the cities of Syria would be desolate. So they flee every way they can. The most horrific human tragedy stories. But God said it had happened this way. But here's the thing. Here's the kicker. We didn't see Israel entering the land. We didn't see the Sinai campaign. Most of us didn't see the Yom Kippur war. But all of us saw this. Because it only happened two weeks ago. Russian troops deploying to the Golan Heights. Now, I don't know if you can see that map at the far right of the screen there, but see the, the, the thumbtack in to show us where we're marking? That, that's showing us where, well, let's see if I can put, there you go. That's the border of Israel. And that red tack, that red point, is where the Russian troops are moving in, even as we speak. We waited almost 2,000 years to see the Jews back in the land. But we've waited 2,500 years to see Russia on the borders of the promised land. And that's where they are right now. Not even two kilometers from the Golan Heights and from Jewish territory. Nobody has ever seen this before. No prophet ever saw this happen. No one was alive to see this because it's never happened in the history of the world that the Russians have been on the borders of the promised land and they are right now. It's a very, very exciting time to be alive. Let's move on to another neighbour. The Palestinians, now they're an interesting outfit, aren't they? Prior to the war in 1948, in which the Jewish people, having been granted the state, won the ability to maintain a state amidst their angry Arab neighbours. Prior to that point in time, the title of Palestinian was largely applied to Jewish people. Jewish people living in Palestine were described as Palestinians. And then on the day that uh, Israel declared itself to be a state, they were invaded, as we know, by seven Arab neighbours flooding across their borders with all the guns and bombs and you name it that they could find at their disposal. They knocked on the doors of all the Arabic inhabitants of Israel and said, look, why don't you just head over the border for a holiday? Go and find yourself a beachside shack for a couple of weeks. This will all be over and you can come back in and, and you'll own Israel. We will, have, we will have tossed the Zionist state into the sea, they said. Give it two weeks and it'll all be over. And so the Palestinians left. Well, the Arabs did. The Jews stayed on and fought, didn't, didn't they? And, and we know the history. Amazingly, the Jewish state withstood this onslaught. And within a couple of years, the UN was redefining the term Palestinian. And they were applying it to Arabic people living inside or sh who used to live inside the borders of Israel. No longer did it apply to Jewish people inside the borders. Now it applied to Arabic people inside the borders. But the definition changed further than just that. One of the very interesting things that the UN did, quite generous really, is they said, in order to qualify as a Palestinian for refugee treatment, you need to have lived inside the borders for, well, generations? No. Your lifetime? No. Two years. Two years was how long you had to have lived inside Israel prior to the 1948 conflict in order to be defined as a Palestinian refugee. And, and what that ignored was the fact that just prior to that time, many Arabs had flooded into this area because the economic growth that was going on. Even prior to the de Declaration of Independence, the economy there was growing and people would come from Morocco and from across the Arabic Peninsula and from the Arab world and flooded in to take advantage of the jobs. And now they've been living there for two years, got themselves a good job. Now they're a Palestinian refugee for life. Now, of course, that doesn't apply to all of the Palestinians. There were families who had lived there for generations, but there were others who had just flown in in the last few years 
economic migrants from Tunisia and from Morocco. And so we ended up with a group of dispossessed Palestinian refugees demanding the return of a state that had never existed. There had never, ever been an Arab state in that place. Oh yes, there had been Arabic empires that overran the entire territory, but never an Arabic state inside the borders of the promised land, and now they demanded it back. And of course, we know what the Bible said. Abraham had been told so, so long ago that these people, the Arabic people, their hand would be against everyone's hand. It'd be a wild ass of a man. Imagine having that said of your son. A wild ass of a man he's going to be. Great, I'm a good parent then. And so God said that the Arabic people would be like this and, and the Palestinians were no exception. Wild and unruly. And yes, the Palestinian people were wronged. We would be foolish to assume that the Jewish people did everything right. They didn't, did they? But wrongs were done on both sides. And successive Israeli governments, as we know, have worked to accommodate the Palestinians again and again, offering solutions, offering land, offering even a state, but to no avail. And the Palestinians ended up in two main areas. The West Bank, so-called, because if you're standing in Jordan, it's, it's the West Bank. Uh, if you're standing in the state of Jordan, the, the country of Jordan, the West Bank is, well, it's the West Bank of the River Jordan for you. And Gaza. Gaza and the West Bank. That's the two places the Palestinians have largely ended up. Now, these two territories pose for us a little bit of a problem when we look at Bible prophecy. And we want to have a look at those problems. So let's go to Ezekiel 38, if you'd be so kind. Because, well, Ezekiel 38 tells us, doesn't it, some, some information about the conditions that will exist in the land of Israel at the time the Lord Jesus Christ returns. At the time in which Gog and his army sweep south, we're told in verse 8 that after many days you will be visited in the latter days, you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword. He's saying that you, Gog, and your armies will come south. You come into a land that is gathered out of many peoples. And he tells us a little bit about the geography of that land. He says, against the mountains of Israel. That's where you're going to come. And therein lies well, I know I've talked to people who've seen this as, as quite a problem, and I've worried about this myself. Because if, if you look at a, a topographic map, a relief map of the land of Israel, the mountains almost completely fall inside the West Bank. Don't they? Uh, the, the lumpiest parts of the land are all inside that Palestinian territory. And that's a problem. We sort of wonder, well, how is it that when Gog comes against the Jewish people, against the mountains of Israel, how are the Israelis going to have that, given that currently it's owned by the Palestinians? And we want to answer that question. Well, the first answer to that question is this. You'll remember that uh, President Clinton uh, brokered a treaty in Oslo with the PLO leader Yasser Arafat, the Oslo Accords. In fact, there were multiple versions of them. There was, uh, I think, version one and version two. Um, but the final version of the Oslo Accords divided up the West Bank into various areas. Because, of course, after the 67 war, the Six-Day War, the Jews actually invaded, conquered, and annexed the West Bank. They own it from a military perspective. And so the Oslo Accords were trying to make a, an agreement between the Arabic side that say, well, we still own it, even though we lost it in a fair war, and the Jews who say, well, we won it fair and square in a war. It's ours now. And here's the agreement that they came up with. There were going to be three key areas in the West Bank. Uh, now, those coming up with this accord were clearly in a very imaginative frame of mind at the time and so they called the three areas area a b and c very catchy and and uh, memorable area a is is well it's about 18 percent of the land of the west bank and that was under complete palestinian control area b israeli security control in other words they would make sure that 
dangerous things weren't happening. But as far as government, municipal services and the like, that would be operated by the Palestinians. Area C, Israeli control. And if you look at those figures, 60, well, actually it's about 63% originally was going to be under Israeli control. And the idea was that the Israelis would give it back to the Palestinians piece by piece as the Palestinians did nice things. Uh, and you can imagine what's happened since then. Well, there's, that's what's happened since then. They've given back 3% of the total land they were going to give back to the Palestinians. And so the territory you can see uh, in sort of a bluey grey colour, well, that's Area C. That's the territory that the Israelis run, control, possess. Palestinians aren't even allowed in there, despite the fact it's in the West Bank. That's 60% of the West Bank. But, but again, we look at that and we go, well, okay, but that's the valley bit. That's the lowlands, isn't it? Most of that's up the Jordan Valley. It's still not the mountains. What about the mountains? Yes, the Israelis might own 60% from a military perspective. They might control another 20%. But what about the mountains? Well, let's have a look at this. Now, I found this fascinating. So what I'm going to show you now um, is, is a video released by... Um, uh, a company called Nofe in Israel. They are a real estate company. They provide villas and properties and apartments and the like. Um, and they are advertising, I think, to an American audience, uh, advertising some property you can buy in Israel at present, right now. Uh, you can find this on YouTube currently. So they're very pleased to tell us about this, this project that they're building, these beautiful apartments. Uh, this says that it's six minutes from Ramat Shopping Centre and 15 minutes from Jerusalem by, uh, by car down the freeway. Uh, it'll have religious facilities should you desire them. And of course, glorious apartments with wonderful quality. And uh, read that text. Did you get it? We'll come back to it. Have a look at what that text I just asked you to read said. Have a look at this. What they're offering is residential, a residential neighbourhood dipped in enchanting mountain scenery. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? Anyone looking for somewhere to, you know, put their nest egg? Let me show you where this Israeli subdivision is currently, as we speak, being built. So there's a map. Uh, you can see, well, I hope you can see, uh, you can see Jerusalem at the bottom of that. Can you all see that? You see the yellow line that I've sort of messily drawn on the map? That's the border between Israel proper and the West Bank. And of course, you see the red pin. That's where the new subdivision is. In fact, this new subdivision is closer to Ramallah, one of the major cities of the Palestinians, than it is to Jerusalem as the crow flies. Now, it's not closer if you, you try and drive there. Uh, 22 minutes by car to Jerusalem, 49 minutes to go to Ramallah, um, mainly because of all the roadblocks in the way. Uh, but all the same, they're offering a beautiful apartment in the West Bank. And in fact, thousands of Jewish people are moving into the West Bank, not as brave settlers in their khaki uniforms with a gun strapped over their back, determined to climb onto some lonely mountain type at top and defend it against the Palestinians at all costs. No, these are people who, well, look, we could afford land out there. You know, it's a bit cheaper, the blocks are a bit bigger, room for the kids to run around, uh, lovely apartments out there. The commute's slightly longer, I know, but uh, once you get through the traffic, it's good. And it's lovely out there, there's mountain air. And interview after interview, with people living out, Jewish people living out in the West Bank, 500,000 of them now. They say that the reason they've moved out is for the quality of life. They're not feeling threatened. They're not feeling worried. Yes, they might think somewhere way down the priority list that this is also helping the cause of us possessing our ancient territory, but way up at the top of the list is we can buy a new home on a large block in a lovely subdivision Kids can go to... There's even a university 
a Jewish university in the West Bank. And we have this picture built up by the Palestinians and by the Western media that the West Bank is this sort of barbed wire surrounded area. There's guns everywhere, bombs going off every 15 minutes. You walk down a street and you get a Molotov cocktail thrown in your face. That's the picture we get from the media. And yet the Jews don't see it that way. They see it as quite a safe place to move out with the kids. They're confident. It's easy to go out there and more and more settlements are being built there by prestigious property companies. And then there's the third way. Here's the third way. And this is exactly the way we see in the media. They are moving out. Some of them determined to conquer the mountaintops. What this is, is this is a map of Hebron, the highest point in the Judean range. And what you can see is there's this sort of orange area to the left of the map. Uh, and there is a green area to the right of the map. The orange area is under Palestinian control. The, the green area is Palestinian still, but under Israeli military control. And then there's some dark green areas. The dark green areas, well, they're Israeli settlements. These are, well, they're very aggressively placed. Many of them have been in Israeli hands for over 100 years. In fact, some of them, almost 200 years. Israelis have owned these particular buildings and blocks. Nevertheless, they are in the heart of Palestinian territory. And they are inhabited by those hardened Jewish zealots that you imagine, ringleted and begunned. And they stand there and they are determined to hold off the hordes of the Palestinians around them. They drive in and out in heavily armoured vehicles. And they bring their supplies in from afar. And they are in the middle of Palestinian... But Nonetheless, they're on the top of the mountains and they're there to stay. They've been there for over 200 years and more and more they're purchasing territory. They're purchasing land off the Palestinians in clandestine deals in which they pay top dollar to buy properties in places like Hebron so that they can own the land at the top of the mountains. So I think, I think when we summarise that, they already control 60%. They're moving in, in in increasing numbers for quality of life purposes. And there are some who are going into the most heavily fortified Palestinian areas with their own guns and standing on the top of the mountains saying, this is ours. For those three reasons, we don't need to worry about the fact that Gog has to find Jews in the mountains when he comes south because he already will. All right, so let, let's move on to those in the Gaza Strip. What does, what does the Bible say about the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Just a, just a little bit of a refresher in terms of history as to what's happening with the Gaza Strip. Uh, I think it was in about 2005, uh, Ariel Sharon, the then Prime Minister of Israel, unilaterally pulled out of the Gaza Strip. They did a completely different thing to what they've done in the West Bank. And in fact, what they did is they sent the army in. They knocked on the door of every Jewish house and settlement in the West Bank. And whether they wanted to go or not, they pulled them out. They, they militarily pulled them out. In fact, the soldiers, there's video footage of the soldiers going to the last settlement in the Gaza Strip. The soldiers hugged the settlers and then walked with them to the, to the armored vehicles so that they could take them out. Of Gaza. There are no more Jews in the Gaza Strip. Then in 2006 there were elections in well the Palestinian areas in the West Bank and in Gaza. In West Bank a group by, called Fatah what came out of the PLO1 and in Gaza a group called Hamas1. Who are Hamas? Well these, these are Hamas. These are you know imagine having these as your next door neighbours. What are you doing this afternoon? I'm oh, just playing with the missiles. Practicing. Well, what for? Can't tell. Sorry. Can you imagine these people being just across the border? Hamas are implacably opposed to the Jewish state. And when you see what they did to their own when Hamas won the election, you realize what sort of people they are. So Hamas won the election. Now, most people, when you win an election, you throw a big party and you let everyone know we won the election and then you start you know, paying your friends back for the favours they did to get you the election. That's how politics works. But Hamas, what they did is they found the people who voted against them, took them out and shot them against the wall. Hamas are 
utterly ruthless and brutal and they're implacably opposed to Zionism and determined to destroy it at all costs. They're funded by the Shia regime in Iran and they are such a violent outfit that even people like Egypt and Jordan, Arab states, hate them. You may have noticed, looking at that map, that they live in exactly the same territory as Israel's ancient enemy. Remember our Sunday school favourite, Goliath of Gath? Remember him? Goliath, well, Gath was a city of the Philistines in modern-day Gaza Strip. And the prophets said of the Philistines, Zephaniah here, Woe to you, inhabitants of the sea coast. Gaza is the seacoast, isn't it? You nation of Cherethites, the word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you to no one heaven is left. And, and if we check it out on Wikipedia, that font of all knowledge, Wikipedia tells us that indeed they were wiped out. Now, I know that's very small, but what Wikipedia says there is that they were subsequently absorbed into the Babylonian Empire and then absorbed into the Archimedes Empire. This is the Philistines, so they're absorbed into the Archimedes or Persian Empire. And then they disappeared as an ethnic group. They ceased to exist about the 5th, 5th century BC. And their five cities, Ashdod, Ekron, Gaza, and Ashkelon, disappeared beneath the sands of time. In fact... There is so little left of the Philistines that the archaeologists find it very difficult to work out exactly who they are because, well, there's not a lot left of them. They're kind of gone, just as God said, disappeared. And yet, here we have a group of people who live in exactly the same... In fact, their sliver of land is named after one of the Philistine cities, Gaza, isn't it? You all thought I was going to say Ashkelon, didn't you? No, okay, joke that didn't go down well, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let's turn up Obadiah, if you'd be so good. Obadiah, let's have a look at Obadiah. What do you say with Obadiah? Chapter one, it's a, it's a one chapter, ch chapter book, so chapter one of Obadiah. Uh, for those of you who have struggled finding Obadiah, if you, well, if you hit Jonah, you're about right, just go earlier. If you hit Micah, you've gone too far. It's between Amos and Jonah. Obadiah. Before we, we look at our passage, let's just have a look at the context. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. A prophecy senses should be tingling at this. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. The day of the Lord is near, he says. Look at verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. This is future language, isn't it? Verse 21. Saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is definitely the language of the future. Verse 20. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites. Even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem which is in uh, is Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. Sorry, one verse earlier, verse 19. They of the south shall possess the Mount of Esau, and they of the plain, where will they possess? The Philistines. So here we are, we're reading scripture that is clearly the language of the future, and yet it's mentioning, mentioning for us a nation long dead, Absorbed into the Archimedes, says Wikipedia. So how do, we, how do we work with that? What do we do with this, this mention of the Philistines in the future? Well, we know the principles of prophecy, don't we? Latter-day places or people are represented by the name of the place they occupied or people who have similar characteristics today. And so, for example, uh, the Tyrians can speak of the British. Even though 
Britain and Tyre are far apart, both Britain and Tyre had a sort of mercenary, naval, entrepreneurial spirit. Both nations have a, have a real similarity in characteristics. And so the Bible describes the British as Tyrian in, in their outlook. Or the modern day Assyrian, there is passage after passage, we saw one with Uncle Carl, in which the Assyrians are referred to, sorry it was Uncle John, the Assyrians are referred to, the modern day Assyrians, who are they? Well, who has got that same spirit, that same attitude, that same ruthless brutality, but, well, but the Russian army, the modern day Assyrians. And so we can use that the characteristics that people possess to work out who it is in modern day times. Or we can just look at where they live. And so Daniel chapter 11 talks of nations long dead like Edom, Ammon, and the chief of Moab. And it just turns out that that's a perfect description for the modern nation of Jordan in terms of geography. And in this case, when we talk about, well, the Philistines... We're looking at a group of people who have both because, you see, we've got a modern day group of people who inhabit the very land that the, Philipp the, the Philistines left and exhibit exactly the same spirit that the Philistines showed. The Philistines had an implacable hatred for the Jews that never let up. There was never a peace treaty with the Philistines, was there? Never in all of the history of Israel. And the Palestinians have exactly the same spirit. So when we come to Isaiah 11, we get a very interesting passage here. Again, this is a modern day future prophecy. It speaks of the time when a signal will be raised for the nations and the banished of Israel will be assembled, the dispersed of Judah gathered from the four corners of the earth. And he says in the final verse there, they, the Jewish people, will swoop. Swoop as an angry bird down on the shoulders of the Philistines in the West. And we, we ask ourselves, so what's going on here? What? What is it that the Jewish people are going to, after the return of Christ, have to punish the Philistines, or should we say the Palestinians, for? What crime? Is it the crime of hosting Hamas? The crime of firing rockets over the Israelis' back fence when they're not looking? Arming young men with knives and popping them on Jewish buses? Is that the crime that is going to be punished here when the Philistines have their shoulders swooped upon by the Jewish people? Well, I think we've got a clue. Here's a clue. Because when we put this passage together with another one, we start to get an idea of what the future holds for the relationship between Gaza and Israel. Zechariah 14, we know this passage so well. A day is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand when the spoil will be taken from the midst uh, and you will be divided in the midst. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city of Jerusalem will be taken the houses plundered the women raped half of the city will go out into exile but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. half of the people 50 percent of the population of jerusalem taken away into slavery and i think perhaps this is a hint as to what may be the final crime of the modern day philistines the palestinians just hold that passage in your mind and come to our reading for this evening joel chapter 3 For those of you who went forward from Obadiah, you went the wrong direction. Bad luck. Come back. Joel. It's earlier. Hosea, Joel. And Joel chapter 3. Again, a prophecy of the future in verse 4. Yay. Sorry, we'll start in verse 3. They have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for an harlot. They have sold a girl for wine. These people, whoever they are, are funding a night out by selling Jewish people. Verse 4, yea, and what do, I have, what do you have to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, modern day Lebanon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will you render me recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Well, what had these Palestinians done? Well, verse 5, because you took silver and gold, you carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and of Jerusalem have you sold. You see? 
These two passages go together, don't they? And, and the crime of modern day Palestine, the Philistines perhaps, is that they sell the Jewish people into slavery after, well, after Gog's invasion. And how might that work? Well, you can imagine how that would work, can't you? They are just the sort of people who would knock on the door of Gog and say, look, Mr. Gog, you're doing a marvellous job, by the way. Love what you've done with the tanks. Um, but uh, we realise you've got some Jews you need to get rid of. You have a problem, we have an answer. We've got a lot of coastline. Perhaps you could ship them off our coastline and we could send them wherever you like from the coastline of Gaza. Uh, this was on the news just recently. It's an Israeli humanitarian plan. Uh, the guy who's come up with it is actually the Minister of Intelligence and the Minister for Transport in Israel. I'll play you the video that this is his promo video. What he's proposing to do is build an island, an island off the coast of Gaza. Um, the idea is this is a really genuinely humanitarian thing he wants to do. If we can build a, a, an island off the coast of Gaza, um, it'll be joined to the land of Gaza by a causeway. The causeway will have an opening bridge in it that can be opened and closed at will so that in a security situation, we can open the causeway up, uh, the bridge up, and, and no one can get across. Um, provisions and supplies and all sorts of things that Gaza requires can be brought into this deep water port. They can export from this deep water port, but we, Israel, can maintain the security of the port. And so it's a bit of a win-win for Gaza as he sees it. But with the passages we've just read in mind... Maybe it's not going to be such a great idea, hey? Perhaps the Gazans, with their implacable Philistine hatred for the Jews, if built, would just use such a convenient deep water harbour <coughs> to ship Jewish slaves around the world. Maybe this is not such a good idea. But we'll see. We'll see how it pans out. We can expect again in this area that the world as we see it will continue to conform to exactly what the prophets have said. All right, let's move on. Sheba and Dedan. Again, Ezekiel 38, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will, will speak up for the Jewish people and say, why have you come down here? What, what are you doing in invading the Middle East and in particular Israel? And, and we know from our understanding of Bible prophecy that we expect to see the ties between Britain that is the, the Tarshish element of this passage, and between Sheba and Dedan growing tight. So, Sheba and Dedan, who are they? Well, in general, Sheba and Dedan represents uh, portions of the Arabian state. Sheba is perhaps best described as the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. In fact, this is quite interesting, this is the city of Sheban. Um, it's, uh, it's known as the Manhattan of the Desert. Uh, it's uh, eight to ten story buildings built in, uh, from memory, the 16th century of mud bricks. The city of Sheban, down there in, in what is modern day Yemen. So Sheba, in general, conforms to that area of the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And Dedan, well Dedan's the northern area in general. In fact, I'm going to show you an extremely blurry map. This is, a, this is a map that shows you the different routes you can take if you're going to do the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, uh, and very, very blurry, I know. It's hard to get a high-resolution version of this map, but you can see the area I've circled there. There's a place called al Ulay, and just under it is the ancient city of Dedan, which was at some point in the history of the peninsula... <laughs> the heart of a large kingdom, the kingdom of Dedan. Here are the, here are the houses they've discovered in what was ancient Dedan. And, and obviously, at some point, it had beautiful architecture and amazing infrastructure. Again, this is in the area of Dedan. And so we believe that there will be strong ties between the British and between those in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula when Christ comes. Historically, that's been the case. 
that these are a list of uh, the protectorates that Britain established in this area throughout the years. 1839, Yemen, for example, became a protectorate of the British. Trucial States, great name by the way, the Trucial States was in fact, well today is the UAE, it was a, a large number of little sheepdoms scattered around what is modern day UAE, who at the time British was in, the British were engaging with them, were heavily involved in the lucrative business of piracy in the Persian Gulf. And the British, being the British, thought, well, you know, we really don't want too many pirates, um, given that's what we do. Uh, and so they, they signed treaties, and, and one of the treaties they signed was known as the Perpetual Maritime Treaty. The Perpetual Maritime Treaty, which they signed with the Trucial States, the UAE, in which they committed to protect them and protect their waters as long as they gave up on piracy and left that to the British. And so there have been strong ties going back a very long time. Saudi, in fact got its start in life when the British assisted them in their first attempt to overthrow the Ottomans. But what about today? This is a recent article from The Economist. I think the title is absolutely brilliant, by the way. With silver and lead, Britain woos new allies in the Gulf. But look what it says. It's just a part of the article. He's talking about the connections that are, are, are growing tight between Britain and the Gulf, and it says, merchants offering everything from weapon to sand for golf bunkers have made the Gulf Britain's largest export market after the EU and America. Lund London fund managers play on jitters over golf stability to attract locals' wealth. And then it goes on to say, well, you know what? The, the people of the Gulf own large chunks of land inside Britain. Have a look at this. A wonderful article from, from the Telegraph. The Qataris now own more of London than the Queen. Uh, just how much more? Well, this graph, it's a bit small, I know, but it shows us how much more the Qataris own than the Queen. So uh, Qatar is that top bar. They own 21.5 million square metres uh, of in a London. By comparison, London owns less of London than the Qataris do. That just gives you an idea. The London itself, the city of London, owns less of London than Qatar owns of London. And uh, about six down the list is the Queen, who owns a paltry 7.3 million square metres of London. Kuwait, they're not doing too bad. They own 3.6 million square meters of London, one of the most expensive cities, by the way, to own on the planet. And so the London City Hall, where all the decisions, the municipal decisions about London are made, owned by Kuwait. They own that building that the city council works in. Harrods, owned famously by the Kuwaitis. The Shard, one of the top 10 most beautiful uh, buildings in the world for people who like spiky buildings, owned by Qatar. And again and again, Canary Wharf, owned by Qatar. Olympic Stadium, owned by the UAE. And again and again, you find that famous, amazing pieces of architecture in London are now owned by the Gulf. The ties between the Gulf and Britain are growing very tight. And, and even the most influential people are recognising how important those ties are. These two... Uh, people are off on a cultural holiday in the Gulf to try and cement ties with Gulf states. And, and it's not just trade. Those links are not just growing in the area of trade. They're growing militarily as well. Oman here has strengthened its defence ties with Britain. And Britain is exporting its know-how to Oman. There are a number of teams now in Oman, British teams, training their Omanis on how to be better warriors. The Royal Navy has opened its first, well, it's the first overseas base for the, U, for the UK military in about 60 years. And they're opening it in Bahrain. And, and in fact, they're not opening a new base. They're opening a very old base that they closed back in the 50s. They're cl opening this base up to enhance their ability to defend the Gulf. And they're putting their brand new cruisers 
into this territory to help defend it. In fact, they're saying they're going to have five of their vessels permanently stationed in Bahrain to assist with defending the Persian Gulf. It's quite impressive. This is a speech by Boris Johnson. Um, it's very small, I know, but I'll read some of you out to it because I think it's quite amazing. Boris said, speaking at a, at a conference inside the Gulf, he said, So tonight I want to acknowledge that this policy of disengagement east of Suez was a mistake. Back in the 50s and 60s, the British said, we've got no money, we're going to leave the Gulf. And he says, now, it was a mistake. Brexit's happened and we've realised, we've seen the light. We need the Gulf. Insofar as we are now capable, and we're capable a lot because we're British, he says, we want to reverse that policy, at least in this sense, that we recognise the strong historical attachment between Britain and the Gulf. And more importantly, we underscore the growing relevance and importance of that relationship in today's uncertain and volatile world. That's why Britain has a total of 1,500 military personnel in the region, seven warships. We have more military in this area than any other Western nation apart from the US. We're spending $3 billion on our military engagements in the Gulf over the next 10 years. We've got a partnership with you that is stronger with anyone outside NATO. That's what... Boris Johnson had to say about his feelings about the Gulf. We've just signed a defence cooperation accord with the UAE. Saudi Arabian National Guard Communications Project has started. Now that's a, a very, very long name, but what it is, is it's a project to train the men and women who defend the royal family, and the people providing that training are British. Operation Kipion is ongoing, which is a non-stop cruise of the Persian Gulf by the UK Navy. An unending tour of the Persian Gulf by the UK Navy. They're very, very closely aligned, just as God said. And look at what he said. You see the word I've highlighted there? Come. Britain, along with Sheba and Dedan, during the invasion of Israel by Russia, say, why have you come? Now, if Theresa May was sitting up in Whitehall, it would be very difficult to say, why have you come? Because, well, the Russians haven't come to Whitehall. But if the British military are there on the doorstep of Israel in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf, it makes a lot more sense for them to say, why have you come? Have you come to take spoil? They don't say, have you gone? So you've come, and that tells us the British are going to be there, and they are. And the world again conforms with exactly what the Spirit said through the prophets over two and a half thousand years ago. But that's not all we would expect, is it? We don't just expect a close tie between Britain and the Gulf. It's actually a triangle, isn't it? It's got to be ties between Britain and the Gulf and Israel. And that's a bit trickier, isn't it? The Gulf, they're Islamic. Israel, they're kind of not. How's that going to happen? Well, it started happening. You might have heard about the fracas over what's going on in Qatar. There's an issue, isn't there? Uh, all of the Gulf nations are, are accusing Qatar of funding terrorism. And Qatar's done very well for themselves. They've got a wonderful media organisation by the name of Al Jazeera. And it's everywhere, competing with BBC and CNN and all the other big networks out there. Just two weeks ago, Israel revoked the press card of Al Jazeera. They're actually working to kick Al Jazeera as a whole out of Israel. And why, did, why would they do that, given they let them in in the first place? Well, the reason is Saudi Arabia and UAE and Bahrain and Oman and all of the other nations, with the exception, obviously, of Kuwait themselves, have also kicked Al Jazeera out. They've said, look, we think you're funding terrorists. We're going to kick your news organisation out of our countries. And lo and behold, Israel says, OK, we'll do the same. Isn't that interesting? And the consequence, have a look at this. Trade talks between Israel and Saudi Arabia mark a historic first. The most staunchly Wahhabi Islamic nation on the planet. Over 2,000 people have died over the last five years going to pilgrimage 
in Mecca. They're very Islam. They really believe. You might get crushed to death, but I'm still going. They really believe. And somehow they're, they're talking to the Jews. Saudi Arabia and Israel in talks to establish economic ties, a dramatic move, says the Times of London, that would put the Jewish state on a path to normal relations with the bastion of Sunni Islam and the guardian of the two sacred Muslim cities. We're seeing it happen, brothers and sisters. A triangle is forming of warm ties between Israel, Sheba, Dedan and the Tarshish power an exact fulfillment of Bible prophecy at the exact moment where the Russians are parked just across the border within reaching distance of Israel. Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, Syria, Britain, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states and tonight Europe, Russia, the church, Everywhere you look, the world is exactly conforming to what the prophet said. And when we're looking at our own lives and we say, I'm not sure what's going on. We can look out at these things and we can say, but God knows exactly what's going on. And he's, if he can control these events so precisely, he's in control of my life too. We need to... Take advantage of nights like tonight. We can't walk away from a day like today and say, well, that was really interesting, wasn't it? Or it really wasn't interesting, however you feel about it. But we can't walk away just leaving this at the interest level. This is not about interest. This should not be academic. What this is about is changing us. This should never be academic. The prophecies were not given so that we could say, isn't that interesting? Isn't God clever? They were given so that we would say he's knocking and he wants me to change and he wants me to be ready. And all of us have got things that we can be doing to be more prepared for the return of our Lord. Song of Solomon says this beautiful passage. On my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. The bride of Christ looked for him in the night. I sought him and I found him not. She says, I'll rise now and I'll go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I didn't find him. The other people watching, the watchmen, the other people looking for him, found me as they went about the city. And I said to them, have you seen him? Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. And I held on to him and I wouldn't let him go. And brothers and sisters, if we feel strongly about Christ, we'll be out there looking for him everywhere we can so that when we find him, we can hold him close. 